notice that it said neurons release a chemical onto muscle fibers. And what do you think that chemical is? Well, what did we just talk about a few minutes ago? That chemical is a neurotransmitter, more specifically acetylcholine. I see a question, is the chemical for hormones released through the brain and electrical is touch and muscle movement. So if I'm interpreting this correctly, is acetylcholine, again, this is what's being released by motor neurons onto skeletal muscle fibers. So yes, it is involved in muscle movement, but the thing is that acetylcholine is not exclusive to just muscle movement. It actually occurs at multiple other synapses not related to muscular movement also use acetylcholine. And we might, we'll, we'll get to that when we talk about the autonomic nervous system. But yeah, so do you do, you already know the explanation of why this Jason has dystonia. He has all this acetylcholine in his system, but it's causing his muscles to contract. Thing is that, can he relax his muscles? This is why he's kind of distorted that way because if he's, he's almost like flexing all the time. If this acetylcholine remains in the synapse, it's going to keep on triggering these action potentials, it's going to keep on releasing calcium into the cytosol of his muscle cells. And therefore, if you have all that calcium, what do we have? Remember troponin and tropomyosin? Troponin, when it has calcium, moves tropomyosin, actin and myosin bind to each other, you get that contraction. So this is why he's permanently, or a lot of times you see him almost permanently contracted. Now the thing is that acetylcholine, we have all of this acetylcholine in Jason's synapses as in the previous example. So motor neuron releasing weight, too much acetylcholine, and it's not turning off. So how do you turn a neurotransmitter off? There's actually multiple ways of turning off a neurotransmitter signal, but how do you turn off acetylcholine? Well, there's something special called acetylcholine nesterase. And again, when they have something that ends with ASE, what is it typically? Or actually, let's ask the chat. I don't have a top hat question. So if a question, question is, if a chemical or molecule ends in ASE, what is it? And it looks like most of you are saying enzyme, and most of you are correct. So the cool thing is that acetylcholinesterase is an enzyme. And what does it do? It breaks down acetylcholine. So this is a great thing about acetylcholinesterase. Now, this is one way you can turn a neurotransmitter off. If you have an enzyme coming in and kind of chemically altering that neurotransmitter, that neurotransmitter can't bind to its receptors and ion channels anymore. Therefore, that shuts these ion channels off. And therefore, this turns those action potentials off. So I actually have to look up if Jason does have a problem with the acetylcholine asterisk. I'm not too sure. But again, this is why it's important to turn off signals as well as not just important to turn them on. But it's also important to turn off, off neurotransmitter signals. And this is what we see here. So acetylcholine is active right now. But when you get acetylcholine asterisk, what it does is actually cleaves acetylcholine into acetate and choline. And this choline part is actually recycled. So this is a cool thing, that you can recycle neurotransmitters as well. So that's another way you can take neurotransmitters and turn them off. By actually reabsorbing them into the presynaptic cell, that's another way you can turn off a neurotransmitter. Now, neurotransmitter, this is why I talk a lot about those diffusion, ion channels, action potentials, and memory potentials. So we're going to talk about excitatory neurotransmitters and inhibitory neurotransmitters. And let's do a real quick top hat question. So say a neuron's memory potential becomes more positive. Say it's at rest, and then you open these sodium ion channels. So now it's becoming more positive. If you may have all these sodium, ion sodium ions or any positive ions flowing into a neuron, will it be more likely or less likely to do an action potential? Oh, I forgot to label the if there's a correct answer, but there is a correct answer. Results. So most of you said it's more likely to do an action potential, and the people who said it's more likely, you are correct. Now, why is that? So this involves this, this is related to excitatory versus inhibitory neurotransmitters. So remember that you have that thing called threshold, and if, in, when a cell or a neuron is at rest, that's when it's below that threshold, 
that it's not firing off action potentials. But once it crosses this line, it can fire off an action potential. So excitatory neurotransmitters, these make it more likely, so they get the neurons more excited, more amped up. So which is going to make it easier for the neurons to do action potentials? Well, excitatory neurotransmitters, they actually, such as glutamate, say we add glutamate at this point, what it will do is actually open ion channels and cause this, to, this neuron to be closer. So which is a harder jump to do, from here to here or from here to here? By giving it kind of a lead and moving it closer to that threshold, this makes a neuron more ready and more apt to actually do an action potential. So again, that difference is now smaller. So excitatory neurotransmitters move a neuron's membrane potential closer toward the threshold. And therefore, compared to the original resting potential, now it only has a little ways to go before it does an action potential. So this is how excitatory neurotransmitters work. They allow the flow of ions that make the membrane potential of a neuron more positive. Now inhibitory, now inhibitory is going to hold back. Instead of making it more excited, it's going to pull back on the reins. So in the previous example, what did we see? We saw that excitatory neurotransmitters, they made membrane potential more positive. Now inhibitory, that's the opposite, right? So instead of making it more positive, it's going to, so, so uh, this is GABA's example of an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Instead of making it more positive, now it's going to make the rest or making the membrane potential of this neuron more negative. Now, is it more likely or less likely? Well, look at the difference. Before it had this much to make up before it reached the threshold, but now it's further away from the threshold, so it's less likely to do an action potential because again you need to go all the way up here. So now it's further away from the target threshold. So inhibitory neurotransmitters, they make prosynaptic cells less likely to do action potentials. And why? Because they made the inside of the cells more negative, therefore reducing their membrane potential, making them further away from that threshold they need to do an action potential. All right, so the summation, don't Okay, so summation, keep it limited to what's in your textbook and what I'm covering here because it can be very complex. So temporal summation is involving timing and frequency, and spatial summation can involve multiple factors. So things like the location of synapses. Thing is that even though dendrites, you typically have signals flowing to, from a presynaptic to a postsynaptic cell via the dendrites, you can actually have synapses from the axon terminal directly onto the cell body of a the postsynaptic neuron. And the interesting thing is that ten dendrites tend to be excitatory, whereas um, if you have a synapse between the axon terminal and the cell body, they tend to be inhibitory. And the number of synapses, again, you can have multiple synapses onto one cell, you can have multiple, like, multiple neurons synapsing on just one target postsynaptic cell. And type of neurotransmitters, some are, neurotransmitters are excitatory, some make it the inside of a cell more positive. Some are inhibitory, they make the inside of a neuron more negative. And temporal summation, so temporal sounds like tempo, right? And tempo, if you have a music background, you know it means the kind of timing of the music. So temporal summation, what we have here is the sec first, I know this is the martini version. So what we have is like temporal summation, you have first stimulus, second stimulus, okay, that's not way too much of time on this martini stuff. So the way I like to draw analogy with temporal simulation, so say you have a best friend and they want you to, okay, pretend social distancing is over, COVID is over, COVID, COVID is done, and your friend wants you to go out somewhere. So say they send you a text message and you're like kind of busy, but what if they start increasing the frequency of their text messages? Are you more likely to respond? Well, in this case, with temporal summation, a neuron is now sending multiple like sig signals, and it's like increasing the frequency of the signals. Like, like if I get a message from my best friend, and it's like, okay, but if he messages like, like, ten times in a minute, I'm more likely to pay attention than if he only messages me like every other day, right? So temporal summation is kind of like that, whereas spatial summation. What you have is, is multiple stimuli and they're causing uh, action potential to a target cell. So spatial summation can be, to use my analogy with like text messaging, 
So locations of synapses so are an excitatory versus inhibitory. So say there's, like again, pretend social distancing and COVID is over, and there's a party, right? So say you have a group of friends and some people you have acquaintances and you're not so, or if like, say you have a friend or a friend and you don't get along with them and you find out they're going. So you're like, oh, maybe I'm not going to go. They're kind of like inhibitory signals. But say three of your best friends are going. So even though there's that one person it's kind of awkward with going to the party, that's kind of inhibitory toward your chances of going to the party. But you have three people you really like going to that party. Well, maybe you're more likely to go. So you can have a mix of excitatory and inhibitory signals occurring on the same neuron. Or it's like, or say like there's a party and then you have your friends going, but your parents are gonna be at the same party. Are you more likely to go or not? Or say like, or it's a, say COVID is still on and you know that your your friend's roommate or like three people going to the party is like they tested positive for COVID because they attended a rager or yeah, or one of those COVID parties. Oh my God! Well, let's not get even get there. But again, spatial summation you can have multiple signals, and then the neuron that's the postsynaptic kind of decides based on the information where it has more excitatory signals or inhibitory signals. It kind of decides based on that whether to send another carry that signal forward. So that's what summation is. Your neurons are receiving multiple inputs, for not only based on like who, what other neurons are sing, sending signals, it's also depending on whether the neurotransmitters are excitatory and inhibitory, but also the frequency of those signals. That's why I kind of like using that text message analogy.